put together on stage, those words coming out of her mouth. <laughs> it's a warm spring day. Someone said, where are you driving to? I told him I was driving to success. I tend to in incorporate these videos and tasks. I'm leaving the gym right now, so multi-purpose. I remember meeting Gene on a day like today. It was nice. It wasn't overly hot. It wasn't humid. It was in the labor pool. And they said we needed a guy to go out. Uh, general labor didn't didn't really have a description on the job so I go out and they dropped me off in the van they dropped actually were dropping people off and it was at a ice factory a place that manufactured ice pack it up in the little plastic bags you know, the regular bag large bags all kinds of ice and it's like okay this is interesting my job was to assist one of the drivers. It's like, okay, how hard could throwing ice be? You know, I didn't really think anything of it, but you take a five pound bag of ice and multiply it by 4,000, that's a lot of weight. So I meet this guy. He's about 5'5", five five with the mustache that's got a little wax on it where it curls up on the end. I bullshit you not, he was that kind of guy wore a silk shirt, gray slacks, and looked like a French pimp. As I got to know him, I think at one point in his life, he was a French pimp. He told me his background, he was a musician, and he just got into entrepreneurship because it was just the way to go. He owned a truck, and he bought the ice from the company on contract. I learned a lot. I learned so much about business going on all these jobs, I just didn't realize it because I was just out for a check, and I wasn't really paying attention to the lessons that I was learning. So I meet this guy, we go out on a truck, and the first day he wore my ass out. There was a reason he was little. Throwing ice is about precision, speed, and time. The more ice that you can drop off, the more money that you can make. So it was, if you've ever worked at FedEx or UPS on the conveyor belt, that's what it was like. We drive up as close to the ice machines as possible. I mean, he had this thing down to a science. You get here, get here. He's like, no, we'll come back. There's too many cars in the parking lot. Boom, 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 boom. And I'm grabbing ice like this. The first day, he got me. I was a little slow. You know, he was making jokes when he dropped me off. And, you know, maybe we'll see how you'll do tomorrow. You know, the day you were a little slow. And he's like, honestly, the first week, everybody's a little slow. This is kind of different. I move fast. Money. Money moves fast. And that's what he did. Snapped his little pimp, French pimp fingers and said, money move fast. Next day, I get up. And my back hurts. My wrist. That's what got me. My wrist forearms, they were throbbing. They were just like, oh, Lord, please, no more French pimp. But I had to go because he was doing eight and 10 hour days. And this was, like I said, just as summer was coming. And he said during the summer, I mean, there was days during the summer, we didn't finish until nine o'clock at night. I'm talking about starting at eight. So it was good coin. It was really, really good coin. But he was a character. Gene was a very interesting character because we would go out and work really hard and then it was just be once the truck was empty it's like head back you know he dropped me off he go home uh, there was a few times that people had special orders he's like hey you want to work a little extra we go pick up more ice and then we go drop it off because the whole thing was about distribution and networks That's something I learned because he had a route like a paper route but the French pimp was a philosopher. He had all types of philosophers. He's a French dude, he's a real French dude, naturalized citizen. And he have, he was very blunt, very unvarnished, extreme candor. And he would just say whatever the fuck was on his mind. One day, we're just driving and he said, you know what the problem is with black people? And at that point, I was still in my entitlement mindset 
I was braced for something just racist. I just knew it was coming. And he said, many of you don't think much of yourselves because if you did, you wouldn't behave the way you do. I had to kind of pause for a minute because it wasn't some like, it, it was just, hmm. Because the thing is, our route was in the hood. We went Simpson Road. There was this little place, this little diner. If you didn't get there before the 12, 31 o'clock, you weren't eating because it sold out like this. The place was just off the chain. I mean, sun, Southern Sunday, after church, best food every day of the week. And I often, I mean, we missed going there once when we were on that side of town around lunchtime because traffic flow and everything. But our route was primarily in the hood. And he chose this because a lot of people didn't want to do it. He knew everybody. He knew all the crackheads. He knew all the prostitutes. He knew all the girls that were on the verge because we, we, we would be over off Simpson Road heading toward the EU Center. And he'd see a girl. He'd say, yeah, six months. She'd be selling that ass. And it's like, how can you tell? It's like she's practicing. This girl was just walking on the street, stopping on the corner and pausing for an in order. I didn't pay no attention to that, but he was deep. He's about that life. He was about that life. And sure enough, I didn't work for him with him for six months, but I lived in the neighborhood and sure enough, he was correct. And other things. Then we would just talk about life and business and he says, now he's got a roommate named Kenny. Kenny's a black dude, and he tells me, it's like, you know, you make more money than Kenny working out the labor pool because when I need you, you're there. There was times we worked seven days a week. You know, he come get me from the boarding house in the ice truck, and we work Saturday and Sunday. I mean, do, uh, he, I do believe that he's gone now because last time I talked to him many years ago, he was very sick. But we worked that summer. We worked that summer. I mean, I lost maybe 20 pounds working with him. It was constant motion. It was perpetual motion. We get in the truck, we get out the truck. Only time that we stopped was when that truck was empty. His goal was to have that truck empty because I like he was cheap. It's like, well, if I have something in there, I got to leave the truck on all night, and that's gas. You know, it's diesel. Then he was telling me about Kenny. And he's like, you know, see, he told me this. He said, you know, you're going to be something in life because you are not afraid of working hard. Because the first few days, I didn't know, I almost got frostbite because I didn't have gloves. I was just throwing the ice with my bare hands. Then I went out and just got some regular kitchen gloves, and that was enough once my hands acclimated. You remember Bruce Lee movies, Sunday, uh, Saturday morning, Kung Fu Theater, and he, like, punches fists in the sand to make it hard. After handling that ice for a few weeks, my hands became stronger, my forearms swole up, and just became more physically fit because you were doing pretty much a burpee, a squat, and an overhead press at times because the ice was stacked up to the top of the truck. And the truck was about four feet taller than I am, and I'm 6'1". We moved a lot of fucking ice. So he's telling me, it's like, you're going to be something. It's like, you know, at that point, once again, I'm in my entitlement mindset. I don't really think much of myself. I'm really not feeling life. I'm sitting next to this French pimp dude. We're throwing ice. I don't feel great. There's no gratitude. There's nothing. And he's telling me this. And this is something that we all have to come to a point where you have to love to learn yourself the way you are. That someone can tell you something that is relevant, that's factual, you're not going to get it because your mind is not prepared to receive it. It's just not going to penetrate. And he told me, and I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, that was my thing. Let's throw this motherfucking ice so I can go home with a bag of ice and drink some Kool-Aid because this was the point that once I learned how the labor pool worked, I was getting out every day. I always had money. I actually had two gigs. I would work one during the day. I would work one at night. And I was starting to, you know, build a little, little cash flow, retire some bills. Just cause you broke, they don't mean the bills stop. So he's telling me this, and he's like, you know, you could do what I'm doing. You I mean you could just talk to them, get a truck, 
get your own route. They're always looking for people because people burn out and they don't realize how much harder. Now, dude was making about 2000 and 3000 a day gross. I don't know what the net profit was because I never knew the distribution of what the wholesale price was. I had no clue. If I had been paying attention, I would have known that because he did everything in front of me. I had the books and stuff, paperwork all over the seat. But you know, my mind, my mind was just not there. It was seriously not there. But he was doing like 3,000 a day, and you know, I was getting 80 to 120 a day, and I was happy with that 80 to 120 a day because it was comparable to what I was making working in the hospital. And, and you know, it was just like, you know, I work, make money, I was really not doing much with my life at that point. But we talked about it and he stayed on me for about a good two weeks. You know, you need to get a truck. You need to get the truck. You're wasting yourself. You're wasting yourself. You could do so much more with your life. And I didn't believe him. I mean, you know, me, the dude sleeping in the room with no air, no heat, you know, crackheads knocking on the window for the previous tenant. That was my life. I didn't really, I wasn't feeling that then one day I got a better gig and you know we parted ways and I stayed in touch with him you know because he was a good dude if I uh, needed a loan he, I mean like I said you know sometimes he advanced me whatever I needed for the week to pay child support whatever and I just work it off because he knew I was gonna work so he was a real good dude but in a strange way he was one of my first active mentors you know, we all have mentors. We all have teachers. When I say active, I got to see from the inside out. I was in the internal mechanism of the clockwork. I was there. I got to see so many, you know, the way he would talk to customers, how he would steal accounts from other people because he would walk up and say, look, you know, I could do better than this other guy. And it's like, no, 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 because all the guys were Indians. Call me racist if you want to. Most of the store owners were Indians. Habib, as he called them. Fucking Habib. And he would just work and he said, you know, I'll fill up your shirt. And he'd go out there and he said, I, oh, it's empty. You know, you, you, your ice day, it's the summer, people want ice. He'd go in the parking lot, right, talk to people. It's like, hey, you want ice, right? You want ice? He's like, yeah, man, I don't, we don't have a barbecue tonight. Yeah, we need some ice. Back the truck up. Before the guy could say anything, we're throwing ice. <laughs> he was gangster with that. He got so many accounts that way because he would just do it. And he would like write up the bill, leave it on the desk, say, all right, my name's Gene. Here's my phone number. You need more ice, call me. I'll see you, right? Then come back. They would pay him, get more ice. <laughs> and it was just incredible to watch that because once again, my, my mind wasn't really received, but dude was making gross 10 to about 20 G's a week, dumping ice. And the reason he worked so hard, we worked so hard from the spring and summer because ice never stopped selling, but there's a peak period. And, you know, he, he had to do, because I think he told me, because his goal was to do about 150 to 200,000 during the summer, which would carry him over through the winter because it's like not too much ice was, you know, ice wasn't flowing like that. And he took the most challenging and difficult route because it was the most profitable. You know, a lot of people didn't want to go in the hood. I mean, we come out of the store, right? Because we do our last, our last drop off and we leave the truck open, right? I leave the truck open, not we, I, I'll take responsibility. And I'm getting ready to lock up the truck and there's this crackhead and they're like, oh, it feels so good. She is up in the truck, taking her clothes off, rolling around on the cold floor like, oh, this is God. This is good. And she looking at us. She said, I suck your dick. Just like that. Just like the, like said, Tally Berry said in the movie, I suck your dick if you let me stay up in here. Then she like comes over and starts like touching me with her little crackhead hands. I was like, get the fuck away from me. And Gene's just laughing. He's like, uh, no, you got to get out the truck. He's like, come on, daddy. Come on, daddy. This feel good in here. I make you feel good. You let me feel good. And uh, he's like, no, no. Get out the truck. I'm calling the police. And, you know, she's like, damn you gonna be like that she puts her little clothes on and does a little crack crack walk away all kinds of stuff happened i'm sitting in the truck waiting on gene to come back and i didn't know the crack hit you know eye contact deal because they would walk and they would look at you directly would not break eye contact 
what I didn't know, I was just like, she think I'm sexy in my ice sweaty state? No, it's like, fool, if you keep looking at her, she gonna take that as, hey, you wanna hit that? I was so naive. I was so naive with all of that stuff. And it, it just continued on. The education of a man that had fallen I was in actually a really good spot because one of the tricks that Gene taught me was one of the things I used in the storage auction business. I've actually put shit in people's cars and I've only had to remove it maybe 20% of the time. 80% of the time, they're like, all right, all right, all right. Just that, Ur, you know, that Ur, salesmanship. And he really worked hard. He was an incredibly hard worker. He was working just as hard as I was. And, um, it, it was now looking back, it was a great experience. When I was going through it, all I could focus on was why I was living in that boarding house. And I didn't really focus on, I could have probably went ahead, talked to the guy, got a truck, got my own route, and been making, you know, 10 G's a month. After expenses, probably netting out at three to four. I could have did that, but my mind did not let me see it. My mind was not broad enough to even dream that. And it was right there in front of me, an opportunity. He would have put in the word. He would have fronted me the money. I know he would have. Because his idea was to get me into a partnership and us go gangster on a larger territory. I already know where he was going. He was not a guy that did things for no reason at all. Very smart. Very, very freaking smart. He was one of those geniuses with numbers I mean he like there was some of the ice machines that had combination locks he knew all of them no pen no paper just it was ridiculous so the ice man was probably one of the best gigs I had I always had money it was an experience and there was many many stories because Gene used to buy pussy and he told me why he bought pussy he says, I'm too busy for a relationship. And I said, what do you mean? It's like, you meet someone, they're going to want to go out. I don't want to go out. I want to sell this ice. I don't want to go out. I don't want to do nothing but work. And when I'm not working, I want someone to be convenient for me. You cannot ask a good woman to do that because she's going to want more. And I was like, okay, you're right, you're right. So that's why I buy pussy. Once a week, I go ahead, get my dick sucked, get my ass licked, and my toes sucked. <laughs> I was drinking some soda when he said that, and I had to clean up the front because I just, I just spit all that out. He was dead serious. He's looking at me like, you, "That's funny. That's funny." Every man wants his dick sucked and his toes sucked. I was like, "I don't know about that, G. I don't know about that." Then he went on to say, "You know, like the family thing wasn't me. Didn't want to do that." It's like, I got two houses, one paid for, this ice thing's gonna pay off this other one, then with what I got left, I'm done. I'm sitting on my ass, and I'm still gonna get my toes sucked, my dick sucked, and my ass licked on Friday night. <laughs> I just broke out laughing, because I knew he was true. He was for real. And the dude, the game this little motherfucker had, like I said, he was about 5'5", five, five, maybe 155, 160 at the most. He would walk up to any woman, tall or whatever, just because he spoke French. He was, a, he was a legitimate Frenchman. And it's like, you're from France? Oh, you're so cute. Next thing you know, they got all hugging him. His head's all up in the titties and shit. And I'm just like, what the hell? I learned a lot from that cat. I learned a lot. And then when he got sick, I learned even more. I heard of the regrets. Because we talk, I called him up because I think that's one of the reasons I have a soft spot for hardworking entrepreneurs, people who are out there trying to make it happen. Because at times, if you're not with the right people, you don't have the right team in your life, it's an extremely lonely life. Because people don't understand you. People make up excuses, they think you're a little crazy, they wonder why you're working so hard. And I totally get what he's going through now that I've had that experience but I would I didn't have that perspective when he was going through it and I talked to him and you know one day it was just one of those moments you know where he became he was always a real dude 
and he just be became more real. He just added real on top of real, and he was sounding a little melancholy, and he was just like, I wish I had kids, I wish I had gotten married, you know, you know, you're looking back, and it's just, mm, didn't happen, didn't happen, and he just got a little quiet. So I got both sides of the entrepreneur lesson. Like the other day, you know, April's Fools, I'm messing with people, right? Because I put up, I got engaged. And everyone that knows me knows that if I ever got married again, it would just happen. There would be no engagement. There would be no pictures. There would be none of that. It will just be like, oh, he's married now. When did that happen? That's how I would do it. So there was all these people, the, you know, people know me for a while. They were like, they didn't fall for it. Not one of those motherfuckers fell for it. But a lot of people... There's one person that really nailed it. He said, no, if, uh, this can't be right because if Glendon was getting married, we wouldn't know for a while because it's a very private person. And I was like, damn, he, that, he nailed that shit. But there's a lot of people that think I would never ever get married again. And the thing is, I would, but it would have to be the right circumstances. Because I have taken N-E-V-E-R out of my life. I don't use the word unless I have to because it's a dangerous word. It creates a set of circumstances that you may have to challenge yourself or you may actually do something stupid because you're trying to keep the status quo that you don't do what you really should do to save face. Uh, I've stopped saying what I will, you know, I'm just like, I'll say, well, I'll, I'll say this. It's highly unlikely I'll do X, Y, and Z and leave room for the opportunity to happen because Looking at Gene, and like I said, he was a good dude. He was a solid dude. He was a friendly fella. You know, he just kind of had his heart all closed up. You know, he probably would have made a great husband and a great father. Because that's one of the things when I say mentor, dude was mentoring. It's like, you do this, you do this. And I told him my situation. And, you know, he just said, one day it's going to work itself out. Right now, it sucks. It sucks. You feel fucked. You're, you're, um, it's going to work itself out because he said, I've seen this happen before. And typically when they come down, they come back and then they're either remorseful or he said they try to get you back. And I was like, you're kidding. And he was, man, he nailed that shit. He nailed that shit. He nailed it with 100% precision because that was what was happening. And I said, not hell no, but fuck no. And it was for good reasons. It was for really good reasons. But in this thing called life, in this journey, you're going to go through some stuff. And there are many people that are whining and their life is not that bad because their perspective is so myopic. It's just, they're focused on a tiny kingdom and they're ignoring the rest of the world. So when that tiny kingdom has a rainstorm, oh, it's dark and lugubrious. Or when the sun is shining, God damn, it's bright here. The, the sun is shining off the windows. It's a very, very small world. So you have to enhance your world. As I look back, because someone was saying that this was therapy, me talking about the labor pool days, and as I come to a greater understanding of myself, a greater understanding of life, that's the you know, ever-going process, I'm glad for the experience, and I'm grateful because all of that madness set up the, uh, the environment, the mental environment, that's the most important environment, I don't care what anyone tells you, the mental environment is the most important one, that I feel that I can do anything. I was in a point in my life, I didn't feel like I was, I actually felt worthless at one point in my life. I really did, because so many things were going bad. And that is what gave me the courage to sit down with no training, you know, no college degree and write a book. And in 14 months, I earned more than half the country earns on my first endeavor of writing a book. That's what came from that experience of, you know, the ice, Miss Dupree, and you know, this isn't the end of the story. There's, there's a lot more. There's, I'm, I'm pretty much probably holding the scandalous stuff back to later, but that's where it came from. Because every day in that state, you have to confront who you are. You have to deal with it. I think that's why there's so much drug use and alcohol consumption when people's lives are rough. Because it's, you, you can't run away from yourself when you stink you just can't it's right there in your face and it can be overwhelming it can literally just make you want to disappear crawl into a hole and cover it up but with all of those lessons and just standing up and standing up and taking the licks and taking the licks and taking the licks 
got to a point where I am not afraid to fail. I will try some ridiculous stuff, and if it doesn't work out, I'm like, okay, that didn't work out, but uh, let's try this, and let's try this. Because one thing I learned, and you know, when, when I talk about getting rich, you have to understand, rich is time. When you control your day, when you control all the hours of your day, you're rich. When you get to that point where you're controlling your life, your time, your hours, you're rich. You're extremely rich because many people never get there. Folks retire for two, three, four years and have to get a job because the money they're making is not enough. A lot of people don't get there. So when I'm talking about getting rich, I'm talking about gaining control of your time, gaining control of your mental environment. Because when you're poor, being poor is extremely expensive. Everything's expensive. It takes you longer to get places. It takes you more money to buy stuff. Since you were so close to broke, whenever you're late, you're paying all these fees. Back in the day, you know, when most people had checking accounts and wrote checks, you know, bank accounts would get you 15, 20, 90. I had a friend every month, $130 of overdraft fees. Every month. Every month. I'm like, now nah, that's fifteen that's fifteen hundred dollars a year. Over 10 years, that's 15 G's down the toilet. That's a car that's paid off. Or during this great recession. That was a piece of real estate. I mean, just so many things that came from that. But being poor is extremely expensive in so many areas. And anyone that chooses that or does something to facilitate that, you are an idiot. You are stupid because many people think equate not working hard and not being stressed out and not having a lot of responsibilities is avoiding you know, the system. When you are poor, you have more exposure to the system than when you have money. And when I say money, I'm not talking about like that dumbass DuPont uh, heir that got off after raping kids. I'm not talking about that kind of money. I'm talking about just enough money where you never worry about your bills. You eat every day. You enjoy life. You take vacations. The bank always has money. When you have that kind of money, it's a different lifestyle. But when you have no money, when you have to get up and go to the labor pool every day to get out because you don't have anything and you know that grumbling sound that comes in your stomach, um, you become very appreciative when you do get some things in life. You become exceptionally grateful for pain because when you hurt, you're still alive, if that makes any sense to you. When it gets to the point where you feel no pain and when everything has been dulled out or you are just drunk on avoidance, you're going to die real soon. Your soul's gone and your body's going to follow very soon when you get to that point. So pain's a good thing. It actually is. I know many people think I'm crazy saying that, but it really is. And when you get to that point of you transcend that, you get to that point where you can look at yourself and be happy most days with yourself. You become grateful for those experiences. And, you know, I'm grateful to Gene. Like I said, he was a mentor. He did a lot of things for me. He was um, a really good dude. And he gave me things that I didn't realize. He gave me gifts I didn't realize and opened up until many years later. Because when someone that you don't know walks up to you and tells you better things about yourself than your family ever did you take notice they ain't saying if they're just not saying it just you know that you know because he didn't have to say it dude was paying me i was his employee he didn't have to tell me that stuff he just said hey you know you can do more with your life you really can you really can i know another conversation we had was about politics and he kind of gave me some tools with that because he's like everyone talking about Bush this, Bush that, Democrats this. He said, you know what the real power is? And he went in his pocket and he pulled out a wad, probably four grand. He said, this is the real power. All that shit you see there is smoke screens because he said the people with this are the people that control them. Democrat, Republican, he said they're all puppets, they all have obligations, and they all have favors to repay. None of them are free. And he's like, don't ever get caught up in that political stuff as a business person unless you're writing checks for a guy that's going to push your agenda. 
because you will you said you regret it and i've seen so many people get caught up in the business thing and their business goes south or they lose money because they're focused on the wrong thing i've seen it so many times and i've seen other people who let the thing go and focused on their business and then life just became lovely uh, they just started to experience all types of success because the focus was in the right place and that's you know one of the things I learned and going through all that experience gave me many days to pull back on like when you know when I say I have a problem and I can figure it out part of that is from going through that experience and talking to people is just there's so many situations that I was in working for other people or working for myself it just gave me a really huge database of problem-solving skills and that's 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 an awesome thing to have that's an awesome thing to have so even throwing ice in the summer in Atlanta I learned some lessons I learned some lessons but this motherfucker was crazy he was crazy because I think one day he was getting a blowjob in the truck when I because uh, he, he's like take your time because I was at the uh, diner getting food for us and he didn't come in and I think he was getting his dick sucked in the truck I wouldn't put it past that motherfucker I wouldn't put it past him <laughs> if he is listening he's probably laughing his ass off and smiling because he's that kind of motherfucker anyway alright this is Glendon I'll see you on the good side